Check, check. How are we? Are we loud enough? Good. Yeah. In the, uh, out in the free seats. Kyle, you got it? Woo! Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I gotta just check my beverage situation here. Um, it's a real let's see, honor um, to be here. Uh, the first uh, Creative Morning Sport Wayne back in January was actually uh, at the B-side where I work. And we were super stoked to host that and be part of it. And uh, I dreamt that one day I might get invited to, <laughs> to speak at one. Uh, so it's really super cool. Um, I'm going to hold this. Uh, the Creative Mornings team is awesome. I've gotten to know all of those folks through that first event and since then, and uh, volunteering to make this happen is really great. Uh, the Brass Rail, I couldn't see from where I was if anyone had not been here before, but if you ever want to come at night and you know are worried about that, just text me and I'll come with you. <laughs> It'll be all right. Um, here's how we're going to... We'll do this. I'm going to offer a little background about myself, um, why I'm up here. We're going to talk about flow as um, momentum, momentum in the community, flow as process, um, flow as inspiration, flow as time. Uh, and then uh, I'm not going to go on any tangents and we'll have time for a Q&A after that. Uh, first thing about me, so I have three kids. There they are. Um, as Charlie on the left, he's six. He took the photo. Uh, Ruby in the middle, 14, and Henry on the right, 15. Uh, pretty much the rest of uh, this presentation is just me trying to either impress or inspire them. Um, I had pretty cool parents. Uh, well, they weren't cool, but they were really good. They were really nice. Um, just taught us the golden rule, my brother and I. Um, my mom was a big worrier. She's at home right now worrying um, that I should be at work and why am I not? And also, is my work work or should I go get a real job? Uh, that job is I work at One Lucky Guitar. Uh, we're a boutique creative agency. Uh, started 19 years ago in my apartment on Columbia Avenue. And then a couple weeks ago, we celebrated our 15th anniversary at 1301 Lafayette. Still totally feels like a startup um, in a really, really good way. I work with uh, 11, it's a team of 11. Uh, I work with 10 folks, uh, warriors. There have been two dozen um, OLGers over the last 19 years, uh, many in this room this morning. Uh, I love these people. I love the team that I get to work with. Um, we try to have fun. I think one of the on-ramps to great work is to have fun doing it, and um, we do that, I think. Our mission statement is we communicate brand soul, and that means wherever brand comes to life, we want to be there. That can be in a documentary film, it can be in an advertising campaign, it can be in an experience or an event, a digital strategy. Um, the big thing for us is uh, we try to be three for three in uh, everything we do at One Lucky Guitar. And the three for three is work with people we trust, work for people we respect, and do work we can believe in. Um, and that's pretty difficult, kind of hard to find, not a lot of money in that. <laughs> uh, but it makes our work and our time together so meaningful and it's part of the flow of One Lucky Guitar. Um, I think in our lives, we've each, before we were at OLG, had situations where we had two out of three of those, and two out of three is actually really good. One out of three is actually decent as well. Um, but when you get to three out of three, um, some really special things can happen. So everything that happens at OLG flows in uh, to the rest of my life. It's not my only job, though. I also work at the Y. <laughs> Uh, and I have a thing called Burpees and Beats, so I instruct boot camp, and that's on Mondays and Wednesdays at 6 a.m. And um, if you're if you're brass rail curious, I'll come here with you. If you're Y curious, I'll go there with you. And it's for all levels, 
we have people at all levels. We modify stuff. It's a ton of fun. We call it burpees and beats because we um, listen to an album in its entirety as part of class. So we'll pick a year and we'll just listen to music from that year. Monday at Central, we're doing um, a 1999 edition. So come hang out. But again, wherever you're at, you know, we've got people who believe in deodorant. We've got people who don't believe in deodorant. <laughs> Uh, I'm also in a band, uh, that's the band that we're called the Legendary Train Hoppers. Um, we were a band first from 2005 to 2007 and got back together in 2015 really to start making music and playing again in 2016. We still play together. We, uh, we play in Waterloo tonight, we play in Roanoke tomorrow, we're just playing Chicken Shacks right now. <laughs> Uh, because of the, we were going to play here this morning, but it's too many gigs. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the name, so when we were first together, the, like the legendary train hoppers, like we, we were able to tell the story, and, the, and the, the deal with the band is we were all in other bands, and we formed this one. Um, but it comes from this photo, so this photo is, um, that's my great granddad on the left. His name is uh, Lafayette Bacon, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and my aunt is a, an amateur genealogist, and she gave uh, my family this photo in 2005. It was part of a big binder about our family's history. And this photo was in there, and I was just like taken by it, you know? And I thought, what would this band sound like 100 years later? It had been 100 years. And so I got with those guys, and we said, let's reform them. And th these guys, to me, look like they kind of rode in on the train, right? <laughs> That's how they got there. And so we said, let's, let's, let's be that band again. So there we are. Um, we're really happy, too, usually. <laughs> um, the thing about the, that band in that era is we also wanted to make original music. So um, that was an era pre-Brass Rail, if you can imagine, the Dark Ages, you know, it was just black and white, it was so sad in this city, pre-rail. But if you wanted to play live music, you really were playing covers. If you wanted to play original music, you were playing punk rock in a basement somewhere, but there weren't places like the rail and the Tiger Room to play original music. And that's what we wanted to do, we wanted to write our own songs and play them. And even though we were doing, our other bands we were doing covers and they were very popular, we were going to write original kind of Americana song. It was, we were going to make ourselves like this unmarketable as possible. <laughs> Come here and play. <laughs> Songs made it up. But so we started making, uh, we, we decided to create the shows that we wanted to play because they didn't exist. Um, and the first one of those is we worked with the Downtown Improvement District uh, to form a block party series called the Wayne Calhoun Troubadour Series. And this was on the block between uh, Barry and Wayne on Calhoun. We did four shows and four consecutive Fridays that did, I see Bill back there, that did trusted us to pick the bands and, and we booked a band called the Avet Brothers, who have been back a couple times to sell out the embassy. We got to play with them. And then that was kind of a hit, so then we pitched to the embassy um, an event called Down the Line. So this was in 2006 that we pitched it and it went, the first one was 2007. And the idea of this was the bands that were creating music in the city, giving them a, a stage to play on uh, that was appropriate for the way they were contributing to our community, the way they were enriching quality of life. And the spin on it, of course, was play the music of those who inspired you to pick up um, your instrument in the first place. And so One Lucky Guitar produced that, marketed it, booked all the bands for the first four years as an in-kind. Um, contribution to uh, the embassy and then it was kind of like we it was a car I and mean, the thing had wheels and they knew how to drive it and we gave them the keys and they still do it to this day and I think it's raised a half million dollars at this point which is cool and made some good memories yeah <laughs> um, after that we started working with the Philharmonic and we presented them with the idea of Fortissimo which was having to fill, again, back up the bands that are enriching quality of life in this community. And we had them back up the Orange Opera and Metavari, and then we had a band from Nashville called Clem Snide come, and it was super awesome, artistically amazing event, but it only happened once. 
the goal was it would keep going, but it, it required a lot of work on the fills side of things because they had to like write symphonic scores to these original songs. Um, whereas the embassy, they didn't have to do anything. So they just like, yeah, keep doing it, man. <laughs> keep doing it next month. It's all part of the flow, and, and I think down the line kind of captured that with that way that inspiration flowed through people, and then here, the way that um, we could have this collision between really rock and roll and uh, the symphony and how they can kind of flow together. Uh, after that, we were tired of doing big shows, so we turned our conference room into the B-side, where we have really tiny shows. In fact, Creative Mornings is not there anymore because we don't have the capacity. So these are 50-person shows that uh, we've had musicians, poets, dancers, um, comedians uh, have graced the stage. It's been a really special thing. We've had over 100 shows. Um, about uh, a third of those are just people who come to us with a cool idea and need a place to make it happen, and we um, are happy to provide that. Um, if you've not been to the B-side, come sometime. Uh, then we decided to go really big again, and we were part of the team that started Middle Waves. Uh, March of 2015, um, I got invited to a meeting over coffee to talk about a music festival, and 18 months later we had the first Middle Waves. Um, and <laughs> uh, Allison was the co-chair, and she's here, and in her talk, when she brought up Middle Waves, she was like, I could just give a whole talk on just this, and we just got to block out the day to do that, and I agree with her. So maybe someday we'll do that. Um, but super excited that this week the announcement that Middle Ways will be at Electric Works. Yeah. 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 Super exciting. Um, also, along with that stuff, we started a company called The Good Ones. Um, this was like uh, uh, everything we know how to do by doing it all. Oh, what? Hang on. Um, so this was like doing everything we know how to do all at once. And uh, this ran from 2012 to 2016. Our tagline was uh, for the boys who like um, fireworks in our souls. And uh, this experience was kind of like, like being in a firework factory and, the, and then like a fire breaking out. <laughs> in, in like the best way possible. <laughs> Uh, there's actually my kid, there's Henry right there, and there's Ruby. And that was when I told her I thought uh, mm -hmm. girls with short hair are super cute, and so she cut her own bangs. <laughs> uh, all that stuff was like a lot of toil, you know, and I was like, I had to work out some energy while all that was going on, and so I ran five marathons <laughs> uh, a couple years ago. and that. Uh, I'll leave that up, I guess, if you want to take a picture of it, but it's just from my Instagram. Anyway, all this stuff, I think, just feels very, like, um, Instagram-y to me. Um, you know, the reality of each of these things is there's a lot of failure involved in it. Um, that's a guy that was going to have a hangover the next day. <laughs> um, and I, I just think, like, uh, you know, um, I do want to talk about the reality of all this stuff too. Like that portfolio is a construct, right, of you know my identity or the way that I present myself uh, in the community. And the reality is, I don't have any more answers than anyone else. I'm kind of here, like, like we all are on this journey, looking for answers. Um, uh, I don't have it all. I can't sing. I'm in a band, but I can't sing. Um, uh, I've been bald for a long time, you know? <laughs> uh, I wrestle with uh, a lot of demons, self-doubt, uh, anxiety. Uh, that manifests itself in a lot of different ways um, that often, um, you know, make me question a lot of things. Uh, never along the way did I find a work-life balance or probably believe in it. I'm 45, I still haven't learned it, and that has been very savage on some relationships in my life. Um, I fail often, lack confidence, and that lack of confidence probably also creates a lot of that stuff too, because I'm trying to kind of make up for it or hide it or whatever. Um, I've had a life coach and three different therapists. I recommend you all do the same. <laughs> uh, 
One of those therapists was just one meeting. But it was good. We got into it. Um, and I think that that's what I like, just this, um, you know, I think to be human is to um, have imperfection. And I, you know, kind of we just worry about this, like that we are filtering that, filtering that out. And when we filter that out, it doesn't, does not make us more perfect. I think it makes us sick. And, um, you know, I think that's why I love like Neil Young and the, the, uh, you know, things that are just kind of sloppy and edgy and about to go off the tracks. Or, and I think it's why like Billie Eilish make, uh, resonates so much right now with a certain generation because of this, this like threat of perfection, right? And it's just creating anxiety or, or like a dread. Um, and uh, I read a great, I read a great article on the new Lana Del Rey record and. Uh, they quoted this old Hollywood journalist named Eve Babbitt, and she says, the thing is, once you make it clear that you are you, and everyone else is merely perfect, and therefore ordinary, then you can wreak all the havoc you want. Which is pretty good. So let's do some shots. <laughs> get into flow. So, um, you know, to flow is to kind of move in this kind of continuous, direction, this smooth continuity to be part of something you can kind of join in or fade out. Um, sometimes flow, I think, can feel like you're kind of on a lazy river and just kind of go with the flow, right? And I think that we feel that in our community, we can feel that in our disciplines, in our lives, um, where you feel like you want to kind of go with the flow, right? Or you might sense that the flow is not the right direction, right, for a project for an engagement for a community and you start feeling like maybe you don't go with the flow um, you want to do a 180 you know push back against it um, and it's tempting I think like as we think about this stuff as like as we develop our own points of view as we develop ourselves as artists as we do develop ourselves as community members to like kind of like dig in your heels and like pick a side like who am i am i going to be that person that's just amiable and easygoing and i'm going with the flow or am i going to be like a contrarian on every single thing and push back and i think that there's a balance in this stuff you know between doing it our way and the way it's always been done um and i think that you know for one like a guitar that's been a, a big thing and we've kind of really found some success or a sweet spot in that, you know? I mean, I think the, the new version of the Train Hoppers was taking away that music was made and putting our own kind of little thing on it. And the same is true with Middle Way. We didn't start Middle Waves to say, let's go take on everything else. It, I mean, the first call we made was to Jack Hammer of Three Rivers Festival to say, what can you teach us, you know? And we're gonna put our spin on it, we're gonna put our zag on that. Um, and there's that balance, right? There's just a big dial. Um, I think that uh, working together as part of the flow of these projects and the, of these initiatives is huge. I think that one thing that we've found is that we're just more powerful when we collaborate and, and to collaborate rather than to compromise, right? And that's part of that dial on us for pushing back or or what our move is gonna be. You know, I mean, I think you can think of yourself being in a boat and, and just a subtle tweak, put your hand in the water and just kind of shift that to your direction and take something the way it's always been done and put your little unique piece on that. And you know, that's part of what we did at One Lucky Guitar. We're part of a big tradition of agencies like ours. And then other times you don't wanna put your hand in the water, you wanna throw an anchor in the water and just stop and go to battle and say, this is BS, let's take it on. Let's up in the status quo. Um, this idea of one foot in the door. I think for OLG, um, part of our flow is one foot in the door, the other one in the gutter, right? So we've always sought to have credibility in the boardroom and the bar room. Um, and I'm not saying which one's the gutter, <laughs> which one's in the door. And that's a lyric, that's a Paul Westerberg lyric from The Replacements. Um, and I think that that's been, for me, that was like a really surprising and wonderful thing about, about my career up to this point was the, the fact that we could have, we could be here at the Brass Rail and have Chuck Surak on this stage as we introduced the first Middle Waves lineup 
and to know that middle waves and auto waves was this fiercely independent thing, but it needed the support of a Sweetwater and a Parkview to say, yes, that's important to this community, and that's going to take these things that are kind of ripples, and it's going to make crashing waves up against Headwaters Park it's Beach, you know, it's going to be a big deal. And I think us having that and finding that was um, a super important thing, right? And um, I got like a really cool video here, but I'm just going to go too long. But this was, I, I said thoughtful things here, and then I made a joke, and then there was this that was really funny. So we're back to this. Uh, <laughs> um, for me, uh, the other thing is just like a feeling of um, I'm not content being content, right? And I think that's part of the flow of, of, of OLG, um, for better or worse. And I think that's a feeling that um, can be kind of super disruptive to you and maybe feel like a curse or a burden until that becomes your habit. Um, and I think that you can make it a habit. I think that with repetition and with not accepting easy, you know, and not accepting complacency. I think complacency, even though it has a lot of letters, complacency is a four letter word, right? It's one of those words that George Carlin should add to the list. Um, but I think that you can, you know, if you think about that, complacency, write that on a post-it note on your dashboard or side of your monitor and just cross it out and look at it every day. Um, and I think that, that for me, like I, um, I think I was on a path to complacency. My flow was go with the flow and just follow it. The, the easiest place it was going, that's how I was raised. And it just felt so unsatisfying, right? Um, and I think so very early for me, two things happened. I um, was probably 20 years old when I first heard the music of, well, when I first like went all in on the music of Bob Dylan. And then like I, the most important class I ever had in college was this oil painting class and where he talked about kind of the impermanence. And I think Bob was doing that and, and the, the change was not just okay, but maybe necessary and uh, not to feel like the way that we are is the way that we always have to be. Um, there's a great Dylan story where um, this journalist is like, Bob, I, can I, I just want to talk to the real Bob Dylan. And he says, okay, which one? You know? um, and and the, the, the line that got me uh, was from this song called It's All Right, Ma. The line is, he not busy being born, is busy dying. And um, so that's on a wall at One Lucky Guitar. And that like hit me at a time when I like didn't have words. Um, you know, everything was feeling I was angsty, everything felt fake, everything felt kind of untrue. I didn't have the language, and Bob kind of like gave me the language. And that has flowed through my life. And, and one of the neat things when you, you know, kind of fall for uh, Dylan is that um, a, a lesson that he can share is the flow of his own story and all of the sources of inspiration he has to create what he is and then the way that flows through him and the way it has inspired so many. And to look at that and to study that um, is really just fascinating to me, like the way that we can all just kind of have impact like that. Um, so this gets into kind of the, the Mount Rushmore of inspiration <laughs> part of the presentation. So I actually have like a, a little Mount Rushmore in the office at One Lucky Guitar. Nobody knows this. It's breaking news to my coworkers here. <laughs> One is that. Uh, two is this painting of Bruce Springsteen. I saw Bruce December 5th, 1992. I was a freshman in college. I was a math major. I was going to become an actuary and drove up from Bloomington to Market Square Arena. And all I could think was whatever I do, I want to be able to do it as passionately as he's doing what he's doing right now. And I bought this painting on a, a roadside little shop and it has been with me for the last 27 years, wherever I go. And it's hanging in the B-side, give it a little wink, ask yourself, Bruce, what should I do? <laughs> um, Bruce, there's a great documentary about um, him making the Darkness on the Edge of Town record and he, um, he said that more than happy more than famous, more than rich, I wanted to be great. 
And uh, those are words to inspire you and also to strike existential dread into you. <laughs> um, next up is uh, this guy, Paul Westerberg. Uh, Paul wrote that line, one foot in the door, the other one in the gutter. Um, Paul's like sometimes on, like Bruce is on one shoulder and Paul's on the other one, this middle finger up in the air. And uh, he was in a band called The Replacements and people, like if you follow their career and his career, like he took a beating for um, moving out of this kind of punk era and making a real run out of uh, at stardom perhaps or about sharing his message with more people depending on how you look at it and I admire so much about his work and his approach and his ethos I should have had it and we actually did a tribute show to him about five years ago the posters right there it's a great poster I should have had it in my slideshow if you want to talk about that, because it was the best night. But when we did that, I wrote a 14-page essay about Paul, and it was called I Owe You Everything. And that's on my website. Uh, oh, one thing about that, too, that was painted by Theo Smith. So, um, Fresh Laundry. Uh, and I paid, uh, I bought that from Theo, like with money. And... I didn't say to Theo, like, hey man, uh, that's going to be hanging in the B-side and think of like how many people are going to see it. I was just like, would you paint me a painting of Paul Westerberg and how much is it? And then I gave him that money and he gave me the painting. And he said, I had a thing on his Instagram a couple months ago, and he said, I can't clothe my kids in exposure. Um, and I think that's something like in this community we should all really be thinking a lot about, especially right now. I mean, you know, like, you know, how wealthy should Theo and Matt Plett, like how wealthy should they be, you know, with the way they've kind of captured so much of this. Who's going to clap? I thought I saw a clap. There you go. <laughs> but I think that's true for artists. I think it's true for poets and it's true for musicians. You get that a lot if you're in a band. Man, think about the exposure you're going to have. So do it for free, please. Um, it's true for architecture firms yep. and uh, creative agencies. <laughs> um, you know, let's go get paid, right? Um, and then the other, so the fourth on the Mount Rushmore, so is Bob, Bruce, Paul, and then this is the B side. And uh, maybe I'll come back to this. Uh, no, I'll do it. All right, so this is the rock, this was a gift to me from uh, Denise DeMarcus. Um, who founded uh, let's see. she founded a company called Matilda Jane Clothing and uh, I think it's possible to have soul, like different kinds of soulmates in your life and um, she certainly was mine creatively um, this was a gift uh, that she gave me and um, she passed away a few years ago we started the good ones together. Um, and I think that um, part of flow and inspiration, I, I think it's it would, you're able to collaborate with someone even after they're gone. Um, she's, uh, I think, part of everything we do, part of one of my guitars, uh, DNA. Um, and I think that, uh, Flow, I think of inspiration as it comes into you and comes out of you. Um, and I think that we should think about that with ourselves and the legacies that we leave um, for those. I never met a person who was more generous than her. She was generous when she was selling dresses out of the back of her small SUV. And she was generous always with her creativity or responsibility, even before she had success. And then more generous than I ever saw with her success. And also just like mercurial, right? Like the most mercurial person I had ever been that close to and close with. Um, Dan's up here reading, I'm not gonna read a poem, Dan's up here reading poems before this. But uh, I think that in her passing, I feel challenged, inspired to like carry on what she meant to me and what she meant to our team. I think we all feel that way. Um, we wrote a song about her in the, in the band called uh, uh, Keep the Mercury Moving," And it's about that need to do that. So I'll just read the lyrics. 
like I said, we got to be in Waterloo tonight, so we couldn't play here this morning. Uh, keep the mercury moving. The rules went up in flames. Push the deadline, push the throttle. Hide the pills, hide the bottle. You got something else to hide the pain. Keep the mercury moving. Keep the mercury moving. We got them all by the tail. Catch the flicker, catch the flight through the air, through the night. I'm pretty sure this could set sail. Oh, you angel, I won't let you waste your life. Uh, keep the old embers burning. Nothing's ever going to be the same. Waste your day, I'll waste mine. Take the trouble, take the time. If I could just take away the pain. Keep the old embers burning. Keep the old embers burning and never share that magic trick. Make a movement, make a mark, light the sky up, light the dark. There's some things we can't predict. Uh, oh, you angel, I won't let you waste your life. Toast your partner, toast your drink for the best ideas, don't blink. Oh, you angel, I won't let you waste your life. So, I think we all think of, or should think of that, like how will we flow forward, right? Um, how will we share what we do? How will we um, collaborate? not compromise with each other. I think Denise like captured this quote by the writer um, Annie Dillard who wrote a book called On Writing. And Annie wrote like this thing about not holding it back, right? Sometimes we want to hold it back because we're worried that we won't have it later, or we won't be inspired later. And she said, do not hold back what is good for a later place in the book or another book but give it, give it all, spend it, shoot it, play it. There will be more. More will arise later, something better. And if you do not share it, if you put it in a safe, it becomes lost. You open that safe and you find the ashes. So I think on creative mornings as you think about like, like that, right? Like, I think we probably all have fear, right? You know, I look at all those first slides and I'm like, oh, what's next, you know? Like, the, you know, but there's always more. There's always been more, right? There'll be more. Um, okay, there's, there's the new shot of Fort Wayne, right? So there's Flo and Promenade Park, Riverfront Fort Wayne. Um, and I think this is the new, like, this is the new image of the community is this, this captures the momentum, right? This, this idea that, that uh, and, this, and the rivers mean so much because they capture that idea that, that they're why we're here. They're part of that flow of our community. Um, I think this like is the you know literal and physical manifestation of like when people talk about momentum. Um, but the thing about like this photo is it just like it's just it's it will never be like that again. That water, the minute we took the photo, will never be like that again. Those people will never be there like that again. That sun, that temperature, the way the wind blew is there and it's gone. It's impermanent, right? I think that, 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 that these moments, that's the kind of thing, I think we have that it happens at the B side, like we'll just be those people in that room. Here, it happens at the rail. We have all of us, Friday, October 11th, this one time in this room, all of us, right? It'll never be like this again. Um, and so I think it's tempting when we think about flow, like to think that it can, it's this thing that we can grab and hold, right? But flow is time and you think you can hold it, you know? I've, I've tried, I've like thought I had it in my hands, in my arms. Flow is time and I'm gonna, it's here. And you hold it in your hand and it slides through your fingers like water. Flow is time. All right, next round of shots. Let's do it. <laughs> um, and the last thing I just wanted to kind of share is um, looking inward. A um, friend of mine, uh, not, not even probably really a friend, but an, an artist who I follow and kind of became pen pals with, but his work like really speaks to like, you have to feel like he's speaking to my life right now. 
And he's talked about this need for um, having prompts or making vows about what's going to happen in his life and how things that he needs to remind himself of to not just think about that photo but to think about the impermanence of it and the way that it moves in these moments and I, I just was inspired by that so I've started to kind of making these vows um, myself and um, it's been really good for me I just like write them and have them and look at them um, and there are things like and they can be aspirational of course you know um, I will look others in the eye I will live for experience. I will not be ruled by fear. I will be true with my children. I will put it in the world. I will not delay. I will not deny my true voice. I will get back up again. I will create a safe space. I will do the hard stuff. I will watch the river and listen to the trains. And I will believe in my flow. And I would invite all of you to believe in your flow. And we we'll give some credits here. So that Burpees and Beats the logos, Jake Sauer, great folks taking these photos, quotes from folks that have inspired me. Um, what's next? We'll uh, start up week, Fort Wayne's next week, gonna be awesome. Hobnobbin starts tonight, gonna be awesome. Uh, if you want to see the band, so the show on Roanoke tomorrow is going to be really awesome, but it's sold out. So our next show is October 27th. We're going to be outside at the Sculpture Garden at the Museum of Art. Um, we're recording that, so we've made two EPs this year. We're going to record this one and be the third, so we're, it's going to be like a live session. And we'll have, it's, it's BYOB, but that's bring your own blanket. <laughs> <laughs> and, because there will be a bar with hot toddies and hot chocolate and whatnot. Uh, and then also join us November 7th. Uh, we made a film about David Wax Museum. They were at Middle Waves last year. And um, they're going to come play at the Arts Lab, and we're going to screen that film. And that should be really awesome, too. And uh, after those events happen, I'm going to put them back up in the front of the slideshow. Uh -huh. And that's my handle where every, all the filters go back on when you go to that and my website. So anyway, a real honor to be here. Thank you for spending time at Creative Mornings this morning. Really, like, I had to fake it. I had to fake so much confidence for so long. I had opportunities that I didn't think I was worthy of. And it wasn't until I was, I just like felt like I was, I've been invited to this table um, for a reason. And then I bet uh, eventually, like, I lived up to the opportunities I had. Um, I, I really struggled with that in so many ways. Um, I also think that. Um, I just surround myself with incredible people. So, you know, the team of 10 folks I work with at One Lucky Guitar, my band, the Middle Waves Committee, none of this stuff, like, it, it's not me in any capacity, it's me being part of uh, opportunity to collaborate with people and to, if you build those relationships on trust and respect, you can just like go to war together, you know? Like, we're not sitting around there's no drama and we're not like questioning like does anyone have our back it's like we're just going to do the thing because we know we have each other's backs yeah it's super tough right you know it's it's not easy none of us show up like craving easy so um I think that uh, my experience before One Lucky Guitar, I worked for four and a half years at a 50 person firm. And then as OLG started, I, I freelanced at a lot of different agencies, often on site. And I would just be able to kind of examine cultures. And I just found that when people didn't have trust in all of these places, 
there was no wind in the sails, you know. So that first one of work with people you trust, is like we invest in that, you know. We invest in that in a, you know, big ways with time, with money, with our hearts. And it's true for the 11 of us in the walls, but it's also true with our vendors, you know. Like we want to, again, like we're ready to go to war for these projects. And it's like you have to have people that you work with that it's trust, right? We're not nothing but that we're on the same side right um and then working for people you respect same thing those other experiences i had before olg like i want to work my ass off you know and i couldn't go to my desk and i'd be in a meeting with somebody who made some kind of misogynistic comment like it was our client now i gotta work hard for this person i don't even like, respect um and then as far as the new work you can believe in like i mean very often Thankfully, you know, with this We Communicate Brand and Soul, we help like articulate like that mission statement or that why. But if we haven't done that, we still have to fully understand it. Um, and we can't start work without that because, again, we work really, really hard to do the stuff we do. We do a lot of in kind work, we do a lot of nonprofit work. It's like to do that, we got to work hard. And like we can't work hard if we don't know, like, by me doing this thing, it is helping these people who I respect and believe in achieve their vision. Um, so I was born here. Uh, the only time I moved away was just down for school. Um, we liked to move into Nashville at one point. A lot of the early work of OLG was musicians, record labels, and I thought I needed to be there to do that work. Um, but I've really just felt like a person that um, I wanted to help make things, build things. Um, you know, I think that especially in a creative discipline, you can go to a place that's kind of made it, you know, on the coast, or you can go to Minneapolis or, you know, Chattanooga, Nashville, and just like enjoy what has been made, or you can be part of helping make something, you know? And I wanted to do that, you know, I was part of. Gen X, and so moved back here from school in the mid '90s. Everyone's just like sitting around at Henry's, complaining about Fort Wayne and grouse and blah, blah, blah. and uh, and then like a lot of people left, you know. And then those that didn't leave, like started doing stuff. Um, Corey is a great example with this bar. Like we would sit around and talk about what if there could be a venue for those bands that we have to drive to Ann Arbor or Indianapolis or Bloomington or Cleveland or Chicago or Dayton to see what if there was a place here that they could play and Corey and his partner John like made it happen you know and like I feel like being part of that in this community is like just an amazing and awesome and contagious thing like you know so everyone in this room is doing like I just look around you're doing amazing things and to be to be part of that fabric is like that's what inspires you know Well, I mean, they're, they're just like, so many, I mean, you know, like work's not easy, you know, and so I just feel like we, like that happens on, you know, daily, uh, one like a guitar, like we got like, just been traveling this week, people got people all over, and like we're still just, but I would say a high five moment, uh, Allison's here, but I remember when the Flaming Lips were playing, and she and I were like in the office at, just two of us just in the office there at Headwaters Park, like not even enjoying the show we kind of helped make happen. So many people who were in the red shirts were doing that and it was just like, it's just kind of surreal, you know? And it was a high five, right? We got a photo of it and it, uh, it's like, that's my memory of the Flaming Lips is being surrounded by people who I admired and trusted and, and collaborated with. I don't remember the big hamster ball or any of that stuff. I saw photos of it later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, one more round of applause for Matt. <laughs>